Hey man, well, uh, thanks for being with us. We'll uh, uh, get things kicked off. And I thought if you wanted, it'd be really cool if we'd start out with an intro on you, man. Obviously, Steve from Pulse, but there's more to Steve from Pulse than just being Steve from Pulse. Indeed. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with the two of you today. And a little bit of background about me. I have been at Pulse Discover now for 16 years. Um, interestingly enough, unlike a lot of people in the industry who move on to another job in financial services, and there's a lot of background and experience that they have in financial services, that doesn't describe me. My uh, joining of Discover back 16 years ago was my first entry into financial services. My background just prior to coming to Pulse was actually in biotechnology, where I ran investor relations and communications for a small biotech company here in Houston. Prior to that, several jobs in communications, marketing, and media, but uh, certainly found a home at Discover. And then outside of the professional you know, confines of what I do here at the company, I'm an avid endurance athlete. I, I love running. I love cycling. You know, I have a thirst for the outdoors and uh, really do enjoy competing. So that's a little bit about me. I love it. I love it. Hey, I, I ran a 10K once, you know? Look at that. And you live to tell about it. There you go. to tell about it. No, it's <laughs> fun. In, in Austin every year, uh, Schlotzky's does the turkey trot, right? And so, you know, people dress up like a turkey. And I, I always thought all that stuff was really fun, you know, and a good community of people. Absolutely. So it's, it's a good pastime. There are some that are uh, not as healthy, right? Well, they, they need to be <laughs> in Houston where it's flatter than it is in Austin. Yeah, yeah those hills are tough. That's right. That's true. We do have that advantage here in Houston. It is, yes. it is flat as can be. Well, so Pulse is a premier BHB sponsor, which is greatly appreciated on behalf of all community banks. Uh, as you well know, all the not just your your IP, your support, the community of people and everybody being able to work together, but the dollars go uh, so much towards helping fund the entire operation and giving bankers that knowledge base to connect on. So it's appreciated. Pre appreciate the, the acknowledgement of how Pulse has stepped yes. up to help support bankers, helping bankers. I mean, community banks are the lifeblood of the communities they serve. We all know that. And the launch of Bankers Helping Bankers just gave us at Pulse another opportunity to support those community banks. That's how Pulse grew up, if you will, back 40 years ago, we were founded primarily by community banks. Those community banks continue to be the heart and soul and the majority of the financial institutions that we serve all across the country. And it just made a whole lot of sense to put our thought leadership, put our investment, put our dollars into a service like Bankers Helping Bankers. Just made too much sense not to do. I, I wish people really, if you could see what I see, you know, of yeah. all of the staff at our company, all the, the partner staffs that we have at other companies that we all rely on. And then if you took the volume of that in one day of how many bankers call and need help on an issue on this issue, maybe it's a compliance issue. Maybe it's something completely unrelated to what you do, but yet I don't know that they all really get it. It's people like you and people like Pulse that are standing up to say, Hey, we support this. And so these people say, oh, it's free. Nothing's free. We all know that. Sponsored. And, you know, for people to come up here and say, look, this might not perfectly benefit my company, mm -hmm. but I see the good of the whole. I mean, that just, oh, that makes me feel, I got goosebumps talking about it. And uh, what you guys do, I just want to say, Discover Pulse doing what they've done has helped more bankers than you'll ever know. That's true. Appreciate right. that. That's, that's, say that's why we're in business. It's great stuff. Yeah. Hey, so real quick, Steve. Um, the the Pulse Network, right? So as I understand it, I'm thinking about, you know, when we're looking at a typical company that services community banks, it's always the next thing. It's add-ons, more and more stuff, new products, everything else. You guys are really focused on doing what you do, staying in your lane, doing it really well, and have done that for a long time. Is that a fair statement? You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because that is something that I wanted to cover in this discussion today, because I do believe it relates to how community banks need to think about their business and how they need to be successful in what we all know is just an uber competitive environment today. So to your point about Pulse, we were founded by a set of community banks 40 plus years ago now with a mission of 
providing access to money. And that started way back in the day, providing access through an ATM over the course of several decades now. That's expanded into utilizing a debit card at the physical point of sale to expanding into using debit at the digital point of sale. But what hasn't changed, despite all that evolution and in some cases revolution in financial services, is exactly what you alluded to a minute ago. Debit's all we do. We, we've never strayed from that mission. We've never veered outside of our lane to tackle ancillary services, to tackle core processing. Sure, we've had discussions about yeah. whether or not we should, yeah, we should branch it. out and, and expand our business and do we need to do more. But we ultimately felt the best we can do in serving our clients is to remain focus, focused and do one thing really well, ideally better than the competition. And that's focused exclusively on debit. And that has served us well for 40 plus years. Uh, in 2022, we processed 6.2 billion transactions, which is just a few more, just a few more than we processed back in 1981 when we were founded. We're proud of that, but more importantly, we feel as though that exclusive focus on debit makes us better in serving our clients because they know when they come to us to talk about challenges in their business, sure, we can help guide them around you know, maybe some fintech challenges, or we can talk about what's happening in, in their depository business and things of that nature, but we're not going to steer too deep into those conversations. We're going to stay focused on debit, and we're going to talk to those community banks about how they can make the most out of debit. That's what we do. It served us well for 40 plus years. Fantastic. And not to make that sound like too small of a topic because that is a huge knowledge base right yeah. that is a there is a heck of a lot lifetimes many many careers of understanding just in that world uh, alone there's a lot no. yeah just read mm -hmm. a debit contract one day and it'll make your your head spin but, uh, <laughs> that yeah. is true yeah. i've had entire debates just about the plastic right, right. So you talk to somebody for an hour and the call goes over just talking about plastic yeah. it's unbelievable Right. Well, I mean, if you're if you're a payments geek like like we are at, at Pulse, and we say we say that proudly, right? We're we're into payments, we're into debit. The card matters, and the material of the card matters, heck, more than it it, it has ever mattered because of sustainability and, and how you're choosing materials that are, are promoting sustainability in the, in the environment. That's a topic that is important today. Um, we, we can talk about that stuff all day long because it's what we do and it's what we get energized about. I got a great question. So, you know, during the pandemic and all that, there's, you know, I hear a lot about card manufacturers being behind and backlog and all that. Did that affect you guys? Absolutely. We were supporting some of our clients on the launch of, of new programs. For example, getting their cards uh, transitioned over to contactless and having that functionality on the debit card. There were several financial institutions with whom we worked who couldn't issue those cards on the timeline that they were hoping because of the materials shortage. That has eased over the last couple of years um, and you're, you're seeing you know, financial institutions being able to get back into the marketplace and, and compete with contactless cards for sure. Uh, there's a lot there. I wanna pick your brain just real quick, a, a little bit of a, a broader topic, but you're such an expert, not just in marketing and brand and everything, PR, but specifically in financial services and the card space, right? What are the trends? What are you seeing? What should we all be thinking about? I mean, obviously, digital issuance, things like Apple Wallet, right? And some competition with things like Apple Card, et cetera, right? Um, that space is, is obvious. And then I think the point of sale, not being physical, being digital, right? Uh, card not present transactions, all of that is definitely the trend side, but what are we missing? You've covered a lot. And in particular, I want to delve into the, the card not present aspect of where debit is headed, because in a very short time, as most who are, are listening to this podcast know, primarily because of the accelerant that was the pandemic, we've gone from card not present use in debit to being very minuscule as part of the overall debit portfolio to a point today where a digital transaction 
now accounts for about a third of debit use. That has just accelerated exponentially over the last three years. And what, what we're proud of at Pulse is having contributed to the investments in the industry that have given consumers the confidence to utilize debit in the card not present space. We've been tracking debit trends at Pulse through our debit issuer study for 17 years now. It's a study that we publish every year as part of our service to community financial institutions as part of our service to the industry. And one. we've seen the development over time where at one point there were some concerns that consumers had about utilizing debit when they weren't at the physical point of sale. <laughs> the investments, and, and you, you know this, and, and the yeah. investments that the industry has made in fraud mitigation strategies, in authentication technologies, to be able to validate validate that yes, this is a valid transaction in the in the digital hands, perhaps is the best way to describe it, of a valid cardholder has given consumers confidence to utilize debit in that card not present space. We believe that's only going to continue to accelerate moving forward, particularly as consumers are using a debit card to set it at the top of a digital wallet, for example, in app. They're increasingly utilizing debit for bill payment online. That's where the growth is coming in debit, along with account to account transactions as well. Things like peer to peer payments, for example. Well, I mean, we're talking about some pretty nice revenue opportunities from the interchange side, right? I mean, thinking about bill pay, if you're a typical community bank, certainly depending on how old that bill pay contract pricing is, right? I mean, that can be one heck of an expense. And think about that as the old world of, you know, ACH paying for bill pay versus the new world of somebody using a card on file at the merchant, right? Online. And so to your point, you turn the cost we, want that, income yeah, we want that to be the bank's debit yeah. card and we, we can make a lot of money. So let's take that fairly simple example as a revenue opportunity. Give us some tips, tricks, thoughts. I mean, things like that example. How do you go out and message to the customer base uh, with all the things that you have to juggle, right? You've got everything from technology education and do you go granular on how to do it, right? What are what are some of the tips we should learn? You don't go too granular on, on how. You focus more on the why. We okay. live in a why world because with the proliferation of, of so many choices, particularly in financial services, it's very easy to get banking services that we traditionally think of as only available at banks from a wide variety of different companies. So the what isn't as important as it used to be. So don't get too granular on it. Speak to the consumer about the why. How is this service that you're going to provide make their life easier? How is it going to save them time? How is it going to reduce friction? And what I would say is tie those messaging messages into, for example, bill pay or recurring payments, where you want to convince the consumer that ultimately they're going to be very well served if they use their debit card as their recurring payment for, let's say, something like their monthly Netflix payment. Set that card, forget it, with, with what are called real-time account updater services that networks like Pulse are bringing to bear, if that card does need to be reissued, the consumer doesn't have to do anything to get that number back in that recurring payment category. So we're making this as easy as we can for consumers. And where this truly has a benefit to community financial institutions is that additional interchange income that, that you mentioned, but also science shows us that 40% of what we do each and every day is habitual. Right. We love habits. We love routine. We love just sort of going on autopilot with so many different aspects of our lives. That's where setting a debit card for a recurring payment comes into play and where we at Pulse and Discover have helped our financial institutions with this. We actually have a set it to debit marketing campaign that we make available to our clients to help them in this regard. So tying it back to that habitual sort of put it on autopilot uh, idea that, that we as consumers want, when that happens, 
they are very unlikely to change it because they truly have just set that payment. They've forgotten about it. It becomes on autopilot and is a benefit to them because it removes friction, saves them time. It's a benefit to the community bank as well. It's generating interchange income. Did you say set it to debit and forget it? Set it to debit. That's that's our that's our pithy campaign line. Set it to debit. That's great. We can throw we can throw the and forget it into it as well, but that's not part of our trademark. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I like it. So if I was a banker and I'm coming up on my debit contract, how long from the end of my contract, kind of how forward before that time frame should I engage with with you? We're typically having conversations with community banks a year or more in advance of that transition, because while we can stand up a financial institution relatively quickly to support them on the Pulse network, as we all know, there are other service providers in the value chain. So the coordination that is necessary in that value chain does take a little bit of time. And there certainly is a, a long sort of sales and discussion cycle that often goes into this. So typically we're talking with community banks well in advance of any change they want to make more than a year ahead of time. Okay. Second so, question I got for you. Uh-oh. Is, uh, it is, you have to tell them if it's going to be a two-part. You know what I mean? Because I might change the answer to part one. I kind of think like my banker guys are like, oh, <laughs> questions here it's like you know are most of my contracts exclusive or could i have both mm -hmm. you know could i have a, a visa branded and also have your cards as well i mean can we do discover as well you but can we yeah we have we have various configurations with our clients um, given the rules that are in place today with compliance to regulation ii all banks in the united states need to participate in at least two unaffiliated networks to be uh, in compliance with regulation II. So that's resulted in a typical scenario where a community bank is going to want to maximize the economics of front of the card and back of the card. So if they're, in our opinion, if they're doing the right thing, they are participating in only two networks. That is typically the best way to maximize the value that you're going to generate from an income perspective. So you'll have one card, you'll have one brand rather on the front of that card, an unaffiliated network on the back of the card. And if, if I may, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in with, with a, click, a quick plug for our business on this. One of the aspects that makes our, uh, our sort of sales pitch, if you will, to community banks a little bit different than some of our competitors is we don't have specific requirements that you participate in both of our networks. If, for example, you want to discover on the front of the card, we don't require you to participate in Pulse on the back of the card. And you, you obviously would have to have another network in that scenario anyway to comply with Regulation II, but we want to make those decisions the financial institution decision. So we don't require, for example, in that scenario, participating in Pulse, which is one of the ways we help differentiate how we go to market. And, and one of the ways we don't have mandates like some of our other competitors, for example. That's a really important call. And I mean, look, I think I'm going to be very blunt here with our banker friends. You could see the business case if Steve was to tie the two things together, we could see the reasons why, right? And as a banker, we'd think the same way. The benefits on the sales cycle side of not tying them together, Steve, I would say are probably marginal. Where that real pain gets felt, you don't actually, Steve doesn't actually get the credit that's due during the sales cycle because the pain that's felt by the banker is when it comes to the renewal time. Right. And you, the first time you say the word conversion, you're going to find out what you've done. <laughs> Makes sense. Right. And so I, I think, look, you, that's such an like a powerful. This is my moment. Right. <laughs> like as earlier, <laughs> that's such a powerful point to me, because it what you just told me is you guys have been all about and with community banking for a long time and you're going to be for a lot longer because you probably won't get the credit that's due to you from most a banker that you talk to today for 10 years, right? It, it's, it's, a fair, 
it, it's a fair point because the, these relationships develop over time. You learn more about each other as a client, as a vendor, as those relationships develop along the way. But it's one of the aspects of how we've chosen to do business at Pulse Discover is in the, the Pulse solution, we've stayed true to debit. So you're always going to have, as the community bank, transparency into our pricing transparency into our fees and the interchange that we deliver for you because we're not bundled with another branded solution that can make things, we'll just say, a little opaque right. if you are getting all of your services from one vendor. That's one of the ways that we've tried to differentiate what we do at Pulse and Discover. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Word of the day. It's a good one, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I tried that... to be kind on that one. I tried to be kind on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, he right. could have said it a lot worse. Yes, yeah. yes. Hey, uh, real quick. So I'm, tell me if I'm crazy on this. I've been talking to, obviously, tons and tons of bankers with all the, you know, the craziness going on. Um, and I mean, how do we make revenue, right? That's the question. Deposits is a mess, right? I've got now some pretty serious and significant deposit competition, right? On the right side. Uh, rates are a mess. The loans are messy. It's a sort of a messy time on the very traditional deposit lending side of banking. Interchange is like this little beautiful it's, gift. It's wind resistant is what we talk about. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. The loans are kind of supersonic and then you got people kind of, yeah. let's say trapped in their house. Yes. It's like, even if you could sell your house, the person that would be the buyer is like 7%. Let yeah. me think about that, right? Yeah. And so it's a weird moment in time on both cost of funds and yield on, on loans. And then here's this wind-resistant income. It's good. It's just steady eddy, yeah. always good. Yeah. So if you're a community bank, how do you, I mean, A, is that a fair statement, right? And then second, how do I double down and like work on my program? Is it marketing? Is it other things? And where is all that going? What do you think? It's absolutely fair, a uh, fair assessment. And in terms of growing the business, it's looking for, I would say, a couple of opportunities. One, how do you reinforce the value of debit with the power users of that product? Because you don't want them to be attracted by the shiny ball over here or the new fintech app. Uh, over here that gives them potentially a reason to think about a relationship with someone other than your community bank. So continuing to reinforce the benefit and, and keeping debit top of mind with those power users, we believe that's a very important point and part of the marketing strategy because it's often easy when you're evaluating the business to say, I don't necessarily have to communicate as much with the client's who are already using the product. And that's something particularly as a marketer that, that I disagree with. It's continuing to emphasize the why I am doing business with you as a community bank. That is just as important with your power users as it is in trying to grow new business and attract new clients. So let's tackle that part for a minute. How can you bring new people into your business? And it is differentiating your offering from all of those other choices out there. And it's a point that we make consistently with our community banking clients is we believe there's a competitive advantage within that community footprint that community banks have where fintechs can't compete. Investments that you're making in your community support of local businesses, support of small businesses in those local geographies. You as a community bank can own that message and own, for example, um, social and, and governance and other environmental issues, because those are all very, what we call on trend with consumers today. You as a community bank can own those issues and own those trends within your local geographies that, frankly, the fintechs can't. And I would even argue to a certain extent that larger banks can't quite own in the same deep-rooted way that community banks can own as well. How do you utilize that competitive differentiation and that competitive advantage to draw in new customers who are increasingly motivated by doing business and wanting to have relationships with more local businesses because they see the benefit in community investment. That's where we would say you'd want to focus your time on growing your business 
and generating new clients. I love it. I, I feel like dollar spend advocacy is a big empowering thing in the last handful of years, right? And to your point, I mean, various topics, they're environmental for sure. But uh, I think if you're the average American uh, over years and years, you've recognized, I mean, think about what we saw over the weekend. Let's just call it Twitter's fault, right? Because we're all too connected. Uh, but social has driven this situation where now all of a sudden in real time, we can organize people on a topic and get very emotional very quickly. Lots of little voices. How do we turn into one big voice? Well, the dollar is a damn good way to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. dollar advocacy is a big one. And I think to your point, banks are like the heart, the lifeblood of that topic and, and certainly in their geographies. I love the term dollar advocacy because the, the research shows you that consumers, and this skews a little bit more strongly in younger consumers, want to do business with brands, including banks, that stand for more than just the bottom line. So if you can, if you can tie you know, your business strategy to that dollar advocacy, you're going to win in the marketplace. It's, it's an interesting strategy, too, because... Look, I've, I've often talked about the in a what a lot of people don't understand in a you know in a major metropolitan area versus a smaller regional community. Those younger retail consumers that we talk about who might not have a lot of money or, or, or they are definitely going to be a nice lending base in the future. But more importantly, oftentimes their parents are the business owners and the the commercial deposits that you really want, right? And so you have these young people coming home showing mom and dad what the cool banking app is, right? Or the cool feature. Uh, and that is a nice draw for getting the the small businesses, right? And that advocacy to the point. And, and th those are going to be homeowners. Those are going to be parents. Those are going to be potential small business owners in those communities over time. And, 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 and bankers know this, right? It's, it's the life stages that you go through that increase the lifetime customer value of those customers as they move forward with additional opportunities for lending, with additional opportunities for selling products and services into that, that consumer uh, market. So the more you can do to establish that relationship early on and around something like you mentioned, dollar advocacy, the more likelihood you are to retain that customer through those various life stages. That yeah, cool starts with the kids, yeah, right? I know we're short on time, but I'll tell you what, man, the idea of just buy local has just always been a thing for me. And I think most people, you kind of, it gets to be a cliche at a certain point, And then it also comes back full circle where it's more than a cliche. Right. And especially attacking that that messaging early with people. Nothing screams buy local like that, but, you know. Well, I mean, we have H-E-B Grocery in Texas, as you well know, Steve. And, uh, man, my wife, her viewpoint is buy everything possible that's H-E-B brand because that grocery store acquires from local producers as and, much as they can. From and their own when a hurricane or anything. That Think about Houston. Coast, man, they come to the rescue, just truckloads of, of things to help people all the time. And everybody in Texas sees that. It's a great example of what Steve's talking about. Uh, I know we're out of time. I want to get what final thoughts, going? though, man. <laughs> Anything that's on your mind, I want to hear, you know, whatever you want to think, what you see, whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, I would just say in, in closing, what community banks really need to be focused on today, we, we've talked a lot about the, the, the importance of, of investing in the community, the importance of really pulling that lever to differentiate your bank against fintech competitors and some of the other large ones. The other, the other key that I'll leave you with is striking a balance between relationships and solutions. And for a community bank to be successful today, they've got to be able to do both. Consumers don't have to have every single technology advancement and every bell and every whistle on, let's just say, a, a mobile app for your bank, for example. But it, it has to be good enough that helps them solve some problems and remove friction in their life. But consumers also want that relationship to be part of the fabric of a brand. And if you can make that happen, striking the balance between delivering a technology-enabled solution and delivering in those moments where they need more of a connection with a human, that relationship moment, you're much more likely to get them to a point where they'll be a brand advocate 
for you. So that's what I would leave you with is striking that balance between solution and relationship to be successful today. Brilliant. So good. So, so good. It's great. Hey, cannot thank you enough. Uh, and Pulse and everything you guys do and sponsoring bankers, helping bankers. I mean, literally thousands and thousands of bankers impacted by that. It's a heck of a mission, yeah. man. So thanks for being supportive. Our pleasure. Thank you for the time. Had a great time. We'll catch you next time, man. See you, Steve.